Так, о, ура! Здравствуйте, мы очень Hello, we are very happy that you stayed with us and you uh, decided to join us for this interview. I'm a little bit anxious, so I will uh, read the introduction of Pierre. So I'm uh, afraid to uh, lose something important. Pierre de Miron, uh, founded with Jacques Herzog in, in Basel in 1978, the, uh, his bureau. Among their projects, says the major architectural uh, prospects and also the small living houses among the landmark buildings, uh, the London Museum, the Hamburg uh, Philharmonic and Olympic Stadium in Beijing. Small but uh, but amazing projects, the Prada Tokyo, Lena Street, New York, number of office buildings and sport facilities in Moscow. Since 2010, Herzog de Miron has been working on the Skolkova Campus University for Skoltech which eventually was successfully completed and presently the concept has been working on the development of a Badaevsky brewery at the embankment of the Moscow River. And I think we should give a round of applause for all these uh, amazing achievements. I think that we have agreed that we are going to uh, speak English and for the sake of uh, uh, your convenience. If you need a translation, please use uh, translation headsets and we will be understanding everyone without any uh, mediator. English, if you don't mind. Yeah, okay. Um, I wanted to, first of all, I know you have prepared a brilliant presentation for us. So I would like you to tell us about the three projects you have worked on next to the river very similar in one way and very different in another because we know that all of the projects you are making, they always demonstrate the identity of the place you're working in. So I yield the floor to you with greatest pleasure and here is the clicker. Um, can you please dim loud, uh, the light a little bit? Too bright. Okay. Okay. Don't worry. Okay. So um, good evening, and um, it is for me, of course, a great pleasure and a great honor to have um, the opportunity to speak to you all. I hope um, there are many architects. There are also many developers. There are also many politicians, as I think uh, the topic of how our cities will develop on this planet is a topic for everyone. And I prepared a short presentation, and there are two parts of it. A first one is more general, and a second one where I will um, by means of three concrete projects, I will show you how we think about and how we develop urban projects. So the first thing is, I think we should make really a, a differentiation between, or uh, try to define what is what we are facing in talking about urban phenomena or urban planning. And I think that one thing, if you know you have two kinds of questions, we have two kinds of problems. On the left, we call them the tame problems. Those are problems and questions with a solution, which is right or wrong. Let's say a mathematic one plus one is, and I think everyone in this auditorium will say two. And also a chess game or a puzzle you have a piece of a piece of puzzle and that fits exactly where it has to fit so those are the tame uh, the, the, the tame problems which have an algorithm for a solution we face when we speak of urban questions of urban phenomena or urban or architectural questions or architectural phenomena we call them wicked problem because there is no solution for right or wrong. It's more than to say it is better or less good. So there is not the right solution or the only solution. I think this is very important because often people expect this, expect, ah, oh, now you come here from Switzerland or forever and you know how to do it. And 
One of the main questions we also always try to ask ourselves and give a kind a sort of an answer, who plans the planning? Because I'm sure that, pretty sure that there has been no other era or time in our history on this planet where so much has been built or so much is being planned. It's almost like covering like a built crust the whole surface of the planet. And I think knowing that this is the quantity, the sheer quantity, the billions of square meters or whatever, or square cubic meters which are planned and built, I think this obliges us or makes us responsible to think about it. To make a proposal to show how we think things can happen is, we call this the planner's triangle. So we have three systems. The one system is the society, us, all the people who live on this planet, who live in cities, in metropolitan areas, in rural areas. This is the society, this is the social system. Then they live on a territory. So we have an environmental system. And the third one are the actors, or you could call them stakeholders. This is a political system, or this is an economic system. And the planning is all dealing or trading between those vectors. Of course, the environment shapes our behavior. On the contrary, we, as a society, we shape the environment, and of course, the stakeholders or the actors, whether they are political, on the political system or on the economical system, um, they also have a big influence on what is happening or what is not happening. And I think this is pretty much working for everywhere on the planet, where you have also different ways of thinking a society or where you have also different political systems. Then we go further and we have like a question, we have a problem, or we have an error, what to do there? For instance, in the examples I will show later. So again, we have the three systems, the society on top, which I think is the most important, with all its activities that are taking place in urban areas, like living, housing, etc. as you see, shopping, recreating, learning, etc. This is us. What are we doing in the cities? And then the territory on the base where we stand on this ground has infrastructure, has settlements, and the landscape, of course. And from the left, you have the actors, and we see ourselves, our job, to, as actions and measures, to propose things that can be then discussed within this tr triangle. We often work also, and I will show this, in options. So there is not only the one solution, so often you have different options which are better, have advantages and disadvantages, and other solutions have advantages, disadvantages in another way. So we screen those, we show how a decision could be made. We make it comprehensible. We make it understandable for as many people as possible. And we have been so far quite successful with um, this method as we could bring people together and to believe in, one, in something that would be the right solution for this particular question or this particular era. Knowing this, I think a society has some values. And those values, you can call them like organizing principles. And certainly one of them, and us, all the people who are engaged, are active in do thinking and doing architecture, in building, or financing, there is a responsibility towards the people who will use those buildings, whether it's a housing, whether it's an office, whether it's a concert hall, a park, or whatever. So our job is to maintain or even enhance the quality of life of the people. Saying this, 
I think as a second, and certainly now it has never been as important to think and to talk about this, is to maintain and enhance the quality of the environment on this planet. So this is like really a first big responsibility we all have. Then, talking of where it is, there is not an ubiquitous solution for everything. We believe that place matters. That means that specificity, each place, each city, if I take a city, has its own characteristics, has its own specificity. Moscow is not Los Angeles. Moscow is not Buenos Aires, is not Nairobi, is not Beijing, is not Sydney. All these cities, they are like us, individuals, with their own strength, opportunities, needs, but also threats, difficulties. So that's to, to take advantage of this, understand what makes the characteristics of each city or each era we, we are thinking about. Then we believe also that design matters. Design is important as architecture, but also cities in general. They are perceived by us as individuals in two ways, I would say. The one is by using the thing. You sit here in this auditorium. I stand here. Natalia is sitting in an armchair. That's using a building or using a furniture or using a city. But we also perceive our environment. We perceive our environment with all our five senses, visually, acoustically, etc. This makes a difference to visual art, for instance, where visual art has no use. The use of visual art, for instance, is being useless. And having this uselessness, it makes this open for many, many things. We can't be op as open as architects because we have also the use factor in our job. Then also we think we want that people be visionary. Think of a big picture. Not just, oh yes, I may do this or this there. No, you need like a bigger picture when you are thinking the city. And then what we call really sustainability in the broadest way is to have a long-term plan. That's for, in our sense, sensibility. Then how to proceed? We propose five possible strategies, which is build on the build. So don't waste land more and more but build where there is already building, where are already buildings or infrastructure. This was an interesting topic yesterday when we were talking about um, industrial areas that are being redeveloped. Then densify towards the center. I think most of the cities, also yeah, the younger generation, they come back to the city, to the center of the city. There is not anymore this endless sprawl into the landscapes. What we will see also is we think and we believe that we should stack different typologies or different functions one over the other. This is what we call mixed use, of course, a very common now goal for many, people, for many cities and many architects and urban planners. And then, last but not least, preserve the cultural heritage. Also, this will be one of the project key for this project and for the success of, the pro of this project, as we believe that cultural heritage is important for our societies. Even more today, where things are happening so fast, where many people have a, some of a disagreement or discomfort with this world which is changing so fast. So you need to have some grip on things that you know that have already um, proved that they are something that people can like, that people are attracted to. Yesterday, for those who were not there, in a panel discussion to get together with Alexei, Alexei um, I had a keynote and I presented three projects and we rapidly show them. That was Tate Modern, El Philharmonie and Badaevsky. You see, one is in London, one in Hamburg, and one in Moscow. They are both, all the three, 
they are on a site that was industrially used. In the case of, power of London, the power station. In the case of Hamburg, a warehouse. And in the case of Moscow, a brewery. I will come back to this, to the Badevsky, of course, more in detail. But just to show that, that the industrial era, the industrial building, is changing into a multifunctional landmark. It's becoming a landmark. It's becoming a landmark also because it is a heritage piece. And it became, certainly for the two, um, the already built projects, Tate Modern and Elf Philharmonie, highly visited uh, public buildings. Tate Modern, as you see, and Elf Philharmonie, and Badevsky again, hope that this will also be the case for Badevsky. So it's an evolving, this is transition within a city from a monofunctional industrial building to a cultural institution, whether it's a museum for contemporary art or music hall, to a highly visited landmark. And with this building, which is a building within the city, you create or you, you, you upgrade the whole neighborhood. And we call this like an urban acupuncture where, with a needle, which is the building, which is Tate, or which is Elf Philharmonie. You, you create you, a lot, you generate a lot of energy into the urban body, similar to the acupuncture, the Chinese acupuncture, who just finds the right spot to have as much energy, positive energy into the human body. And this you see here, like Southwark, which was a very unknown era and almost criminal era in London, has become now a most popular era along the river. Same for Hafen City in Hamburg, and I'm sure also this will be the case for the Badevsky. Now I come to the six ex uh, examples I will show you. This one in LA. One in Basel, where we are based, our office is based, and of course, Badevsky in Moscow. So the arts district, and as for all the projects, we first we also try to understand where it is located within the city. On the, le on the left, you have the ocean, Pacific Ocean, and this huge sprawl. This is exactly the country of concentrating something in a center, like most European cities do. do. But here in LA, it's an endless sprawl. The, the ones who have been in LA, they, it's almost not understandable what kind of city this is. And uh, we understand that we are here, if you see in dark, is downtown uh, LA, which is on Bunker Hill, it's slightly elevated. And our site in, is, is in the so-called is in the so-called arts district, so where you have warehouses, I will show some images of it. And if you see here again also historical plan, that was of course, that was agricultural land, it was close to LA River, which was sometimes flooded, sometimes it was dry as a highway, and how this um, the, uh, era developed, and we understand that this is on a real the crossing, like in a Roman city with the Cardo and the Decumanos, of three main roads. A north-south road, which is Alameda, and the east-west road, which is Wilshire Boulevard. Certainly many people know like Hollywood Boulevard, Sunset Boulevard, and Wilshire Boulevard. Those are the, really the main east-west boulevards in LA. So if you see that the urban fabric, with the warehouses, and we believe that we have, with this project, we have three achievements. The one is that we have different building typology, then again, the mixed use and the stacking. Looking at the era of LA Arts District, you see those warehouses or um, facilities for light industries. And so we, did a very intense, intense, in-depth analysis of the existing, knowing that there is a really very active community there which is, cares about its neighborhood. 
And so we needed to talk with them, we needed to integrate them. So you couldn't just import something alien into this, this neighborhood, but you had to take to consider, to take into consideration what is there, not only architecturally, not only in build structure, but also in social activities which are there. So it's the integration, so understanding how this part of the city is very much transform, transforming itself. So there were the small building, small scale, mid-rise, mid-rise, and then also the in-between spaces. So it's not just only a piece of architecture, but to understand the city as a social system uh, that needs here to continue its life and not to bring in something which is completely alien to it. Uh, again, different activities so that you live, you work, you go to school, you, you shop, you have all the different activities I mentioned in one of my previous slides, they are here in LA. So we created a very simple concept which is an infrastructure I could compare to a table. And under the table you have functions that are related to the street life and above the table you have functions that are living and also office. So a few images, this project is now in entitlement process, a very long process, and California is highly democratic, so almost everyone can oppose. We have public hearings and public hearings and public hearings, and up to it everyone is is somehow satisfied about this. So that's certainly very important um, procedures and that we as architects need to understand and play some sort of a catalyst and make things understandable, comprehensible, as I told you or I showed you with the decision tree. And here we integrate some given elements of the LA Art District, working with graffiti artists and so to give them also the possibility to have their uh, expression also in this new structure. So this is like under the table, I may say so, um, and again also the stacking. So above we have the table, under the table and above the table, where along the main street, Alameda, the north-south street, we concentrate high-rise building um, which are on top of uh, this table. On the other side of uh, the block, we have a hotel, also the buildings that are above with the stores, with the wooden store, a hotel. And um, also above this table, those are the housing projects, the housing buildings, um, to also with the wooden stores, um, and that have like a sort of their own um, their own world above the commercial, above the more urban life which is happening under it. That's how it looks like from the air and you see in the middle this large um, warehouse uh, and we did also several tests with what kind of high-rise. You see in the far, you see downtown LA which has a cluster of and concentration of high-rise. You have also Koreatown, you, so you have other places in LA where you have the concentration um, of high-rise building and we think that also there we can have this concentration but having many, many slim towers and not a slab like on the left because that would block too much the views. And we see this building, this is an example, another Herzog and Demo building in Beirut, the Beirut terraces, something very open, something very, for this climate of LA, you may understand there is no winter somehow there, so a, also a living a facilities that give also the people who live there an outside space on a terrace. Or you may know this building also a very slim tower uh, which expresses also what is, what is in the building itself. It's not just an extrusion of the same form from the bottom up to the top, but the, the form changes according to what is happening in the inside, having in the lower side, having the smaller apartment, in the middle, mid-size apartment, and on the top, you have really, the really large units that can show as unit themselves. So that's the same image now with the project, hopefully starting um, next year.
now in Basel. Basel is a very is a city state. We are very small in um, in land, so we are obliged to think about how to use the city ground in its best way. We call this uh, Nordspitze. And again, the image, how, is it, how it is now, and how it was also, industrial, logistics. And going back, you understand also that that was before the 19th century, that before industrialization. And understanding what is the topography, where is it, and to understand also the, the, the place where it is, and here it is between the main valley of the Rhine River and of a affluent, of a side river, and where the, the two come together, this is where we have um, our, 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 our site. This is an uh, old analysis, almost uh, 30 years old, uh, what we did about Basel. I show this because I think Cities can also be explained in a very bold way. We have here on the left, you have the city along the Rhine River. And I show this because I truly believe that also in, um, in Moscow, you will have sooner or later, it's already starting with here the park and with the Badevsky, to have important venues, to have important public spaces along the river, making the river much more attractive. There are also the the, um, the city along the uh, train tracks. And uh, what the challenge is, is a very successful shopping mall. It's called Migro Retailer, and this is one of their cash cows. And they can't, um, they can't accept or to have like one day of lost revenues. So this, the whole thing, this whole shopping mall needs to be continuous and uh, have its um, revenue. It's a concentration also in Basel, again, to, sh to propose or to advocate for concentration of high-rise building. This is Roche headquarters, um, which we are currently building um, with the office for Roche in, in Basel. The shopping mall, as I said, has to be kept. Parking is, of course, very important. I'd rather show now some images how now this neighborhood, which was mo uh, monofunctionally used just for shopping, cars coming and get it out, etc., and trucks, but now this part of the city becoming much more lively, much more urban, with, or with much, um, many more activities than just the shopping in the shopping mall. And the three towers um, for housing, uh, we choose the cylindrical, we choose the round form in plan because there they almost have no orientation. They need to relate to all around themselves. If you put, would have taken a rectangular or a square foot um, floor plan, then you would have four sides. But with this, you have all around, you have almost part of the same surface. And having inside a rectangular uh, layout, that is certainly more uh, advisable and more agreeable for the people to live and to make to have their furniture in it. So the round form and inside the rectangular structure. It's a project that is almost finished in uh, London with a similar approach. Uh, Canary Wharf, which was business, 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 you know that. And this is the first housing tower in Canary Wharf. And you see on the water, so this has a high quality for those, um, those people who will live there and hopefully not commute too much, so that have just going by foot or by bicycle to work. And this is, has a similar build-up, having on the lowest side the largest unit, which are some kind of loft-type apartments, then in the middle to have mid-size apartment and the top to have the larger apartments. Paris. 
I show this also because of stacking and to have multifunctional building, not building with just offices or just housing. And this was from the beginning what we have been advocating for. The client first was a little bit uh, unhappy about this. He wanted just office tower. But we said, if you are there in Paris, along the boulevard périphérique, inside you cannot build any high rises anymore. In Um, in, in Paris, you cannot uh, build high-rise within the boulevard périphérique intramuros, and this is on the boulevard périphérique. And the project was like sleeping, was on hold, and why I show this also is because you have now a project which is different from every other commercial or developer's project that are happening all over. This project was unique because it has exactly this multifunctional aspect and has also a public aspect, uh, uh, access to the top. And then what is quite strange is Paris um, um, houses the Olympics in 24. And for Western city mainly it is always a big challenge you know, for having new infrastructures, a new main stadium, new what, swimming hall, etc. And like in London, now in Paris, they reuse the existing uh, infrastructure. So they didn't have like a landmark building for the Olympics. And then suddenly they, find, they discovered this piece, this triangular piece in the southeast, southwest of Paris. And they said, we want to have this for the Olympics. So that was quite interesting how um, psychologically this went through different uh, moods uh, within, within Paris. And also, I think, like in Moscow, Paris likes beauty, is its simplicity. It's just a very simple form, a triangle, and uh, I think they will, will be very well fit with the uh, uh, Eiffel Tower you see in, in the background. So what I see about this multifunctional, it's like the two upper um, images, the black and white, is just if you tilt by 90 degrees a neighborhood of Paris. It's exactly this. You take the ground that is on Paris with all the shops, with everything, you tilt it up and you have it in a high rise. That's the simple concept of this building, and from one side, from Paris, it is very slim. So from the east or the west is very large, you see the full triangle, and from the north or from the south, you see it just as a very thin needle. Green is very important, I make it short, I think now. The green, we can have more than 70% of green space in um, this neighborhood, which is very poor on park or green spaces. So the, one of the main aspects of the project is that we have on top of the, of the shopping mall, of the retail, we have green, similar to this building here. I was very surprised um, to, to understand that at the top of the Great Hall, you have uh, a green space. I think this is very success, very um, convincing and very surprising, and we have to deal with a concept like this more and more in the future, and this is the top of the shopping mall um, where we have housing, or now currently we are discussing to have a school there. Now I come to Badevsky, you know much better than I do all about Moscow, but um, still we need to find in our own words um, where we are and understand what kind of potential or what kind of po opportunity this project brings or can bring. So again, here green space, which are also not very um, 
numerous in Moscow. So we think that the green spaces and also mainly to connect the green spaces. If you think of joggers or if you think of bikers, so that you can go from one end of, to, of the city to another one with a safe and agreeable um, footpaths or, 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 or bicycle roads. So green was very important for us, of course, and this concentric concept of Moscow, which is so clear, so radical in the center, you have the power, the religious, the political power, the Kremlin, and then the rings around it, and then all those vectors going, whether to the north, to the east, to Minsk, or to the south, or wherever. So that's a very very convincing, I think, plan of a city. And this is the character and one of the characteristics of Moscow um, urban era. And we are one, for one of those vectors and also along the river. It's very close to the Kremlin with new Arbat, so it's really central, central. And Kutuzovsky, you also all know that, understanding what kind of existing element are already there, because we want to, in, to work with them and not to work, sorry, against them. And also here the Kutuzovsky prospect, which I think is an interesting urban, urban concept, uh, a wide street and those uh, those buildings, which are also quite repetitive, but I think not boring. And uh, of course, the landmarks, the White House, um, the Hotel Ukraina, and Moscow City. So within those landmarks, um, we thought that we could also create a landmark which is not competing in height or competing in whatever they have, not compete with Ukraine, not compete with, um, with Moscow City or with the White House, but to compete, in a, in a, not to compete, but to be supplementary or to have the synergy with all those landmarks that are around uh, our site. Also, we look far back in history and we understood that our site, the brewery, is on the former city walls. So this also, it would be interesting to show this, like in a very subtle way, but that too can say, look, listen, uh, 200 years ago, this was inside the city and this was outside the city. And with our building, somehow we bridge over, like um, those two conditions of the city where it was very clear, dense inside and less dense and open outside. So this whole um, analysis of history and understanding that history is a, a transformation. The site has been transformed many, many times and will be transformed also from the brewery to the new condition of the Badevsky project. So we think we have three achievements also here, heritage building first and certainly most important one, understanding that many, many people, not only in Moscow, but also in other cities in the world, like in Hong Kong, where we do the police station, where we understood that Hong Kong has been demolishing all its past. And then they said, ah, that's enough. Now we need to keep something of our past. And now the prison is, the police station is now a cultural center. And heritage building here, um, together with uh, experts um, of Moscow, of um, architectural critics and historians, um, being analyzing the building structure itself of the brewery. And here you see the whole existing, and in a darker color, the ones who are really valuable, who are worth keeping. This is more than 30 thousand square meters to keep the existing buildings, which is this. You see, we, see, we d define three buildings, one, three, and in the middle we have two, and even more than was um, listed or protected, we took the small piece you see between building one and three, 
and we add it. We reconstructed a building that have been demolished, the brew house in the center. We could, um, I come later to that. So we create on the south with this red line, we create the front, the alignment of a boulevard with historical facades, which is this. And understanding also how now the Moscow center with the old building and the old streets, uh, how, how um, public they are. The high quality of those spaces, I think you can also create some of that here in, uh, in front of the Badevsky brewery. So we have building one, which was a storage building, low building, um, and that we keep the structure. And this is also sustainable in its best way, as this structure is not just for storing, but it is also now adaptable to retail or uh, to other new functions of, um, for today. So the existing structure and rejuvenate, rejuvenating the city or the, the, the building itself. So re-keep it and not make it a dead monument, but to make it a building that is alive. Second, that's what I show you now, um, image, an old photograph of this old brew house that has been demolished in the 70s. And we think this should be reconstructed to create again what, what, what um, I showed here, you know, this continuous boulevard of this brick facade um, architecture. So recreating uh, this brew house and also having inside a small brewery, um, which is very popular. I'm sure that not only in Basel or Zurich or in Switzerland, you have now very small breweries that are very successful and you could also have here this brewery and uh, sell the beer here to the customers. Building three, I think it's important that I, for those who don't know the project, that I can a little bit explain, you know, what um, the client uh, capital group and the architect intend um, to develop there on the brewery. So this has a different um, typology. So there we will have some services like dance school or daycare. And in those silos, um, we also will want to keep um, to have in a banya. So in those cylinders, to carve them out and to create here a very nice banya which will be open for everyone. Um, now for the housing, of course, the job, the client asked us, Capital Group, we have so many square meters of housing. And we developed, as in every other project, we developed different strategies. So different typology of housing. You can make towers, you can make slabs, you can make whatever. And we developed that and were not so much happy about that. If, look, this is like a little more of the same, like everywhere, sorry to say that. And uh, also masking, masking the brewery that is behind the brewery. This lot of land being between the brewery, the embankment and the embankment and the river. And if you build between the brewery and the embankment, then you block the view uh, on the brewery from the other side of Moscow River, which also will be very popular, etc. So we lifted. That was somehow just as, um, yeah, a crea creative, I think, a creative input to not to have it on the ground, but to have it lifted. And with this, like on this image, you see through the, all the stilts, uh, burying um, the, the house on top, uh, you see the existing structure of the brewery. 
So this meandering, like almost embracing the existing structure on the ground, but lifted above. So the apartments are in the majority are small, um, as we think and also the client that there will be a lot of customers, small apartments, people coming back into the center of the city, having the possibility to own or to rent an apartment there um, and having like a small, a, a small surface. I guess that this will be a trend, not for everyone, but many people will go back into the centers and have smaller surfaces um, to live in. That's one of the views of the apartments um, down to Moscow city. On this image, you see almost all the elements of the project. You see in the back, you see the red hori um, horizon or the silhouette of the brewery, the elevated housing facilities, and in between, between top and bottom, and between the front and the back, a public park. So that's the public park, which is accessible for everyone. Be between the boulevard I showed you before, which is on the south, on the uh, south of the image, and between the embankment um, on the north of the site. So a few images, how we think, and we have tried already to anticipate a little bit the atmosphere that we will have here um, on Badevsky to have it in our pavilion, not to show like the model uh, in plexiglass and in like in a bonsai style um, architecture, which I think is often quite problematic, but to show real things, which is a real birch, which is a, a real plant. So that's how we see the space that will be in front of um, the existing buildings and of the embankment. Then go, you can go up with lifts. This has been, this is of course the, the particular thing or the unexpected thing of this building. And knowing that we have been very precise and very in-depth with the Swiss engineers and also with the Russian engineers to make this feasible, payable, secure, safe, etc. So this is all highly uh, in-depth engineered and we are very uh, ready now to have the building permit procedure. So those, all those activities that are brought together on this piece of the city, which is the retail, the living, the sport facility, etc., the working, having there not what usually has been promoted by modernism, both in the West and in Soviet time, is to separate things. You live there, you work there, you have there the theater, and you have to move between all those activities. The interesting, I think, modern city connects or brings all those activities together. And this in a very small, small um, pocket, uh, to have it in very condensed way here on Badevsky. The embankment, the embankment, um, that it is not just the three achievement of the heritage, keeping heritage facilities, having housing at the best location, have a public park. So those three things, we think there is either a fourth one, which is the river. And again, showing and having examples that have proved this in real life in, in Hamburg and in London. So I, uh, Badevsky will also be um, activating the riverbanks and the river. So the river become a very, very important feature within the city and the cities are lucky who have a river. Not all cities in the world have rivers like Milano or Johannesburg. They have no water. And I think this is a very important element, also understanding that we 
human beings, we like to be in a park. We have to green to see flowers, to see trees, to smell flowers, to smell trees, but also to feel the water, the water element as a one of certainly the main elements of, of our lives. And this is an image from a movie. And we uh, strongly believe that this will be soon the case. This is real. This was on Moscow River, has been demolished. So there is not only a disindustrialization of the sites, but also of the river. And our last image, or my last image, will be also a proposal we make is to have a public bath in the river in front of the Badevsky um, brewery, park, and housing. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Good. Now it works. Okay, I don't think we have too much time uh, for an interview, so I will try to ask you some of the most important questions. Now, you started with saying there are wicked problems when there is no right or wrong. And one of those discussions which are basically eternal is about different approaches to preservation. So I wanted you to tell us about how you think it should be functioning, what is the most progressive vision? And even maybe give us a couple of examples where we could use this thinking. OK. Um, again, I think there there is no recipe. And I would advise or that we should look carefully at every example or every, um, every facility that is at stake. The, the most famous example this year is Notre Dame. And I, my personal opinion would be to keep Notre Dame as it is and to rebuild it as it was and not to have a contemporary intervention because I don't think uh, architects would be able to do that. So I think I'd rather than go for the safe, um, for the safe solution and rebuild the cathedral exactly as it was. Of course, you may say you don't have exactly the same stone, you don't have the same timber, but I think you can certainly, with our technologies, you can provide um, as, as well as it was in the 19th century, certainly the spire by Viollet le Duc. This is certainly the most difficult to rebuild, but I think our, our building industry and uh, heritage architect are capable to do that. Perfect. Thank you very much. Now, the other one I want to... But then, to of course, this is like one very um, radical example because it's a symbol uh, for France, not only for France. Can you imagine how many visitors? And I think churches, they have, or religious buildings in general, they have both. They can be for religious purposes, or, or, but they can just be also for meditation, and I think this is the use uh, and, the, of, and the value of those buildings. And others like Badevsky now, we highly recommend to keep, if possible, old structures, because it links from the previous phase to the coming phase, and to have something where you can grasp, you know. Of course, you need to uh, to look at the conditions and uh, how is the, the state of um, the building itself. In the case of Badevsky, they are not in a, such a good shape. So it's also um, for the architects and for the client mainly to put money into it, so to preserve it to a next generation or to next generations, hopefully. Yeah, I think that many of, uh, of those present here, just like me, are now dreaming of uh, getting the chance to live in the, in the Badaevsky after the reconstruction. Now, I want to get to the Russian context a little bit. You know that last year we hosted the World Football Championship. And there was a lot of preparation for that in Russia. And there have been a lot of stadiums constructed. Unfortunately, not all of them are actively used right now. Now, we know that one of the most famous projects of yours is the bird's nest in China. I wanted to ask you to tell us how it functions. And in case it works well, it is successful 
post-Olympic use. Please tell us, what is the recipe to making it the right way? Mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's interesting in talking about uh, those big um, uh, fan, uh, facilities, you know, or institutions like Olympic Games or World Cup. And I mentioned this example of Paris, where it was like the other way around, where it was not a sports facility that was like the face or the landmark of the, of the Games. Uh, so that is like one possibility. And the other one in Peking was like this. You had um, a first client, I would say so, which is the IOC, because China organizing the Olympics for 2008, they needed a facility. So the IOC was the client, so the Olympic uh, Committee. You have to provide the 400 meters, uh, everything, you know, the marathon gate, etc. So you have to make, check all those things that you can have the games that happen. So that's like the first client. The Chinese, they were quite smart, I think, as they understood that those facilities are just used for three weeks. This is pretty stupid to do a facility just for three weeks. Maybe two months later you have the Paralympics. But then for athletics, it's not so obvious to fill it like a football stadium like every week. You know, you have no champions, nothing, you know, and then you have not the optimum um, relationship between the pitches and the uh, the pitch and the tiers, the spectators and the game, and that's the disadvantage of a track and field stadium like an Olympic stadium. So the, the Chinese, coming back to that, they said, okay, we are smarter and we have a post-Olympic use of the stadium, which to say to have a hotel in the booths, to have a, in the media center, they plan to have a, um, they plan to have a, a shopping mall, etc., etc. So they have, after the games, they can use this stadium in a different way. And we at Herzog and Demeron, we thought we have even a third client, because we think it's pretty stupid, because normally it's for just politicians or whoever who think now it's important to have the games in their city or whatever. And for us, it was very important, and you see, that what we hope that will be for many, how many people have been visiting this stadium since it has been erected. And we just, um, you see, that's the inauguration day. Um, so that's what it is made for. 95,000 people or 93,000 people being broadcasted all over the world, but just the stage for that, you know, and how much effort this would be. And um, when Jacques and myself went the first time to China um, with Ulisik and Ai Weiwei, we have been, first of all, we wanted to understand what is a Chinese culture, what is the Chinese way of using the public space, how we do the same here in Moscow. We try to understand how Moscow people uh, when are they in the space? And what makes the space attractive? And Chinese are very special, very radical in that. They use the public space all year through. In winter, in summer, doesn't matter. And they dance, they play Go, they make Tai Chi, they make everything, you know, they chat, they listen to music. They use the public space, like Mediterranean. And what we wanted to do, you see, they dance here. So what we wanted to create is a space for them, that's the concourse, where people can hang run around, they can sit around, and that's why we have now per year uh, 3.5 million visitors, is half of the Eiffel Tower, but still I think this is a pretty uh, substantial matter. The, it's also ticketed, so you pay, so this money is then there to maintain the facility. So it's self-sustaining in, in economic terms. Very smart. And um, so you yeah. see it's becoming a postcard and they, people, yeah. yeah it's, it's, we and know, we in know. winter they have this now. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> this is brilliant. Now, um, I had a personal question. Yes. How is it different in process when you design a building or a large piece of a city's territory from 
designing a piece of furniture, is it less effort or more effort? How is it different? Yeah, I, I think it's pretty much different because, of course, the chair needs to be comfortable. You need to like it. Again, we are in use and perception. You buy it because it's comfortable or you may like it or not. And if you don't like it, you can put it away. But architecture is not this way. Architecture is immobile. It's not like a piece of furniture at your home you dislike or a painting on the wall you dislike, you take it away. Architecture has, is, is fixed for a couple of years, you know, at least. You know? so or people, centuries. Yeah, yeah, or centuries. The, the good ones, mostly, they, they remain for centuries. They are being kept heritage, for instance. But there is so much ugliness now on this planet. And that's why I urge everyone, whether you are a politician, whether you are a developer, whether you are a planner, really to care about how our environment looks like. And of course, therefore, to plan a city or to make a master plan is certainly the bigger effort, I think, than to do a piece of furniture. Brilliant. And I think we only have time for the last question. As I told you, we're running the All Russia Young Architect Biennale for the second time this year in Tatarstan. And even this year, they will be working on post-industrial territories like the ones you were describing. So we're trying our best to bring in as many young architects and give them a chance. Now, we were yesterday at an incredible session where David Basulto, the founder and CEO of uh, ArcDaily, told us, you know, guys, you're speaking here about how to help young architects, but I've been looking at you the last eight years, and I've seen a dramatic change for better. You have many more young, talented people. They're very, uh, they're, they're coming up with brilliant ideas. Now, the question is why our cities not only, well, Moscow is much better, but why is, not, why is the whole of Russia not changing that much? Do you think it is about educating young architects? Or is there some other recipe you would recommend Russia to move forward, to create liv livable cities, to build good architecture? Yeah, I think it's multi-layered, many things to, to be done. But first of all, I think, is to organize venues like this one, so that you have a public um, forum called forum, but forum in the best way, like it was meant in the Greek times, where you exchange ideas. And I think that certainly healthcare is very important, all the big data discussion, but also the environment is key for us surviving on this planet. And so we need to have the awareness of everyone what it is at stake. And those for formules, as those events, uh, they are very, very important for that. The young architects is one thing, but if you are not young architect, you are talented and you have no job, then that doesn't help you so much. So the, the thing is much more so to have uh, sophisticated and educated clients, because I think there is really often too much just of the benefit. So the benefit is not only money-wise, but the benefit is also social and is also an, uh, environmental and uh, aesthetical also mainly because I mentioned the ugliness and I think we as human beings, we like to be challenged, uh, no, not challenged, to be seduced by nice things. We all like that, you know, whether it's good food, whether it's a good architecture, a good environment, and this we can do I think much better, all of us. And educate, make schools, make this. We have in our office um, more than 50 trainees from all over the world. Then they leave us. I hope that we also can bring something of this thinking to all those young people who come to our office. Some leave also the office, have their, their own office. So it's, I think, a lot of many, many, many um, tasks, you know, and uh, we have to undertake. So please continue, and I hope that Moscow will really have this relationship to, to um, you have also Strelka here, you know, which is a really a, a, a very interesting institution, 
and which brings also people from abroad to come here and to teach or to exchange. So you, I think you are on the right way and like, for instance, Latin um, countries like Spain, for instance, or Portugal, they really believe, France also, they believe in architecture, they believe in the city and they care, they want to care about their cities and I hope that also this will be the case. Uh, for Moscow in the future. Thank you so very much. Pierre, we would like to thank you very much and hopefully Moscow Urban Forum and Strelka and all of us um, through joint efforts we will be able to uh, I, I'm afraid uh, we are now Okay. So much out of time that this would not be allowed, okay. unfortunately. Unfortunately. Thank but, you so much. But the last word, you know, architecture, you cannot do it also in, um, in five minutes or in ten minutes. <laughs> no, yes. but you have time. I know yeah. you have like the guillotine to finish the thing. Yeah, I have and the duty. Okay. Спасибо. Спасибо.